So now that we've established the hypothalamus and its function in the endocrine system, we're going to now be looking at another really important part of the endocrine system that's directly influenced by the hypothalamus, and that is the pituitary gland. So we'll entitle this next flowchart pituitary gland, and this is actually going to be part one, and there are going to be two lobes of the pituitary that we're going to be looking at in the next two flowcharts. And this flowchart will be devoted to the posterior lobe, and thus that's referred to more broadly as the posterior pituitary. Now what we have to understand about the posterior pituitary first and foremost is that its job, its role is entirely involved in the idea of secretion of a hormone. Secretion of a hormone is completely different from the production of a hormone. Just because a hormone is secreted from the posterior pituitary does not mean it is produced or made in the posterior pituitary. And we'll see what I mean by that in just a second. Take a look at figure 45.14. This visualizes the function of the posterior pituitary pretty nicely. Moving forward, the posterior pituitary has one major function, or actually two we could say. And that function is to secrete two hormones we've already mentioned, and that is uh, ADH, antidiuretic hormone, and also oxytocin. Now, in terms of these two peptide hormones, they are secreted from the posterior pituitary, and I want to reiterate that they are not, absolutely not, produced at the posterior pituitary. Okay? They are produced actually at the hypothalamus, and then the hypothalamus sends them through and down the axon into the posterior pituitary to be stored in vesicles and then secreted upon some sort of neural stimulation that requires ADH or oxytocin. So remember that distinction from our previous flowchart. So let's actually now talk about some specifics about ADH and oxytocin. We'll do ADH first. ADH stands for anti diuretic hormone. ADH is going to be a hormone that wants to get to the kidney because the kidney has kidney cells and those kidney cells are the target cell of this hormone. Thus they have the specific receptor necessary for the hormone to send its chemical message that needs to be sent to the kidney cells which serve as the targets. Now, the anterior, the antidiuretic hormone is going to be uh, secreted and also we could just say released, in other words, by the posterior pituitary when water needs to be conserved. So that's our requirement. When water needs to be conserved, saved not released. So let's say we are in a drought situation and we need to make sure that as much water that is within us stays within us. So what we're going to do is make sure that the water does not leave us and leave, water leaving us or let's say the process of excretion is called diuresis. So what we're trying to do is anti-diuresis, anti-diuretic hormone. We're trying to make sure that we keep as much water as possible. And in order to do that, we are going to release ADH from the posterior pituitary, send it to the kidney. Once we send it to the kidney, ADH is going to do the following. It makes the collecting tubes, and we'll learn about this in excretion, but for right now, broadly speaking, ADH makes the collecting tubes uh, the collecting tubes are uh, more permeable to water. More permeable to water. So essentially within the kidney cell, the functional unit of the kidney is called the nephron, there are these collecting tubules. And as things, and as blood and fluid is moving through them, certain things will be reabsorbed. What ADH is saying is that we need to reabsorb water more. We need to make sure water comes back into the body and does not leave in the excretory process as urine or as a part of urine. So what's going to happen is more water, as a result of this permeability increase, there's going to be more water. The term would be then reabsorption because we're going to make sure that water is staying within the body and that's going to be specifically reabsorption into the blood because the blood mainly consists of water and thus what we imagine is when ADH is being produced in a great amount we're going to have less urine specifically less urine volume 
because urine is mostly when in terms of volume it's mostly water and if we're making sure that water stays within the body if we're trying to conserve water in a drought situation in a uh, in a situation where we are very low on water dehydrated is the term that I'm looking for that's when we're going to make sure that this process happens and that's because ADH was produced produced in the hypothalamus, stored in the posterior pituitary, secreted by the posterior pituitary, and activated and uh, functioning within the kidney. That's the ADH story. Now let's move on to oxytocin. Oxytocin is a separate hormone that is secreted by the posterior pituitary, that is produced in the hypothalamus, and thus when we have this secretion of oxytocin, what we have to remember also is that oxytocin is actually found in both males and females. Even though a lot of its function is related to female reproductive mechanisms, this is also going to be found in males as we'll see in just a second. Now, oxytocin is famously known as the birth hormone because it's going to stimulate, and it stimulates smooth muscle contractions. So these are involuntary contractions during a very important time of life and this is going to be uh, of the uterus specifically and this is going to be directly related to childbirth and this is usually also the classic example of positive feedback oxytocin follows a positive feedback loop where you have oxytocin released you have a muscle contraction then you have a stronger muscle contraction because more oxytocin is released and thus you're having this constant amplification of this muscle contraction to promote childbirth in addition oxytocin also is found in many mammals because it controls milk secretion milk secretion or helps control milk secretion of mammary glands. So this is going to then be directly involved in another critically important process of our lives which is breastfeeding. Breastfeeding relies on the hormone oxytocin to control the necessary milk secretion during a lactating process, during a lactating function and mechanism. And thus, we're going to have oxytocin be in charge of that and also be in charge of this childbirth mu smooth muscle contraction stimulation. But interestingly enough, I also find this fascinating because oxytocin um, directly influences behavior as well. So this is weird to think that a hormone is in charge of very, very important behaviors. And those behaviors are some of the most important behaviors of life because they actually are going to govern the way that we act as humans altogether. Specifically, some of those behaviors of oxytocin are going to be things like the care of offspring. What we notice is that we as humans have incredibly, most of the time at least, an incredibly large amount of care for our offspring. And this care of offspring is directly related to a large amount of oxytocin presence within the body. Oxytocin is also a hormone that is released during pair bonding between mother and child, father and child, even between people who some people would say are considered, let's say, in love. Oxytocin is considered the love hormone as well. And for that reason, it's also released during sexual activity. And because of this, it promotes this idea of pair bonding back and forth and also then it would eventually result in the care of offspring. So it's a very powerful hormone that does more than just the childbirth and breastfeeding that many people already associated with. It also is involved in these behaviors. And that covers our look on the posterior pituitary. Remember, secreted from here, not produced here. And now we'll look at the anterior pituitary.